Today we're going to be looking at the rebuttal of Britain does owe India reparations. I have no idea what he's talking about, <laughs> by the way. It's just rude, you know? I don't know, it's just like a whole mess. Hello everybody, Roger says hey. So yesterday I put out a video that was highly requested by Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who gave the argument that Britain does owe reparations to India. Not my most popular video that I put out. My audience is largely a UK audience, so understandably they weren't that keen on it. But I did say that I wanted to watch the rebuttal to that argument because this was actually part of a larger debate. So just taking one part of that argument and presenting that doesn't really give us the whole picture. Honestly, for me personally, what I'm getting out of these videos has nothing to do with reparations. I'm actually kind of on the side. The reparations don't really do much good. And they also don't really make a whole lot of sense because if you look at the history of humanity, it's basically just one conqueror after another, one empire after another. Billions of people have been harmed in some way by pretty Pretty much all of the countries. And then there are arguments of whether or not what happened to those people actually was good or bad for them. For instance, in the comments on this last video I did, there were a lot of people who argued that Britain brought a lot of good things to India. It wasn't just all bad. And I think it's probably more of like a gray area. It's not really a, a black or white issue. Now I'm coming at this from an American standpoint where I don't really have a dog in the fight. I'm more interested in just kind of learning what happened more objectively. I don't know a ton about the British Empire. I don't know a ton about Indian history. So what these videos are doing for me is it is kind of giving me a little bit more context for learning some of that stuff. And it's also interesting just to kind of see the different points of view about what happened. I'm watching these speeches trying to listen to what they're saying and trying to get some history and context out of it. So the video that we're going to be watching today is by Professor John McKenzie. He is a speaker that came right after Dr. Thoror, so I figured he was also the best person to listen to about this. There were eight debates in total, but on the side of Britain doesn't owe reparations. His speech had the most views. So that tells me he's probably the best speaker to listen to on this side of the debate. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I have no idea where he's going to go with this or how he's going to respond, but I am interested in hearing this side of it as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at what Professor McKenzie has to say. Madam President, before I came to this debate, I was already worried. I was slightly troubled because, if you'll forgive me, gentlemen, I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be one of three elderly white men <laughs> speaking against our friends here, and that troubled me. But during the debate, I'd become even more troubled, and I'd become troubled because I think we've been hearing a phenomenal amount of emotion when what I thought we were here for was to debate in a cold, clear, uh, and solemn way the qu question of reparations. Are they or are they not a practical policy? And my answer to that slogan up there is that yes, we do all speak for you. And as I've listened this evening, as I've listened, I've realized that there isn't actually a great deal of difference between the two sides. My other source of anxiety was that this debate would turn into a debate about whether the British Empire was a good or bad thing. There has been some of that, but that I think is in many ways uh, irrelevant uh, to the actual debate. There have been literally dozens of empires in the last four millennia, and one of the speakers from the floor did rightly refer to this, that all these empires uh, have existed and they have all had phenomenal effects. Now, I think that um, Dr. Shashi Tharoor actually conceded the case to our side. A brilliant and witty speech, but at the end of it he said he wasn't speaking about money, he was speaking about a moral debt. And I think 
Yeah, and I think that that's something that a lot of you in the comments started talking about the monetary aspect of paying reparations, which kind of surprised me because if you did listen to the end of Dr. Thor's speech, he did say that he doesn't want Britain to pay actual money. He just wants Britain to acknowledge that reparations should be owed and that would be enough for him. So like he said, it's more of a moral thing than an actual monetary thing. So I think a lot of people who commented on the last video missed that in the speech because they kept arguing for why Britain shouldn't pay reparations. So it is interesting to flip that from, well, let's, let's not talk about the monetary part because that probably is very unproductive at the end of the day. But what about the, the moral part, which I think is maybe even a more complex thing to, to try and process. This guy sounds really interesting. I'm really interested to hear what he has to say. But at the end of it, he said he wasn't speaking about money. He was speaking about a moral debt. And I think that is something that we can all actually uh, subscribe to. And I'm going to really continue in that vein. When I was taught history over 50 years ago, I regret to tell you, I was told that we should never deliver moral judgments upon the past never to impose the condescension of the present upon past times. But I think we have abandoned that, I'll immediately concede. I think moral judgments have become increasingly common in the study of history. I actually agree with this as well. I've mentioned it in previous videos of mine where, you know, maybe slavery was brought up and so forth. And I absolutely am of this thought that it is a mistake to apply present day sensibilities and morals to something that happened two or three, four hundred years, you know, thousands of years ago. Uh, because the world was in a different state then, people thought differently about things then. I, I assume that probably 200 years from now, people are going to look back on today and say that we're wrong about a lot of different things that we're doing now. You know, and how would we feel about that? How would we feel about somebody from the future imposing their morals on what we're doing today when we think that what we're doing today is um, fine, you know, in our eyes? I actually agree with this. You have to look at history within the context of the, the times, you know, because it's different. And I agree that it is indeed very difficult not to deliver moral judgments upon slavery, on the handling of past famines, and upon colonial warfare, just to mention three of the uh, obvious and tragic examples. And I, he just mentioned slavery there. I want to, sorry for pausing it, I just want to clarify that I'm not saying that slavery was okay, <laughs> okay? I'm, I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying that um, you, can't, you can't judge it from our lens today, is all I'm saying. But to jump from there to reparations strikes me as the wrong direction to go. First of all, and this has been mentioned a couple of times, and I want to underline it, reparations comes from the root to repair. Reparations are akin to penance. And the concept suggests that if you perform this act of contrition, you make amends and you have escaped the wrong. Mm. The debts are paid, you have a fresh clean sheet. And that is precisely one of the things that worries me about reparations. Yeah. They have an air of finality about them. Obligations are wiped out. And I think that it is much more important that we should keep the moral debt that Dr. Thoreau re re referred to constantly in our minds and work to towards that in a whole variety of ways, including the... Uh, yes. Not a moral debt, that's right, not a moral debt. And uh, I'm going to return to this, thank you very much, Your Excellency, but I'm going to return to this in, in other ways. We've already heard that reparations can be a dangerous instrument, and I agree with the earlier speaker who said that it is very, very difficult to calculate um, an amount to be put on past wrongs and into uh, human uh, suffering of the past. What sort of scale can we conceivably use for this? It seems to me that it is indeed impractical. I think there is no doubt, I 
completely accept this, that the wealth of the United Kingdom, both as a state and as individuals, has been built on the profits of slavery, of course it has, and on the profits of many trades um, since then. But I think we ought to remember that throughout human history, there are great shifts in the weight of economic um, power. I'm going to suggest, surprisingly perhaps to Dr. Tharoor, why does Bengal not pay reparations to Dundee? Silence, you don't understand, do you? Well, the fact of the matter is that Dundee represented the absolutely classic economic nexus, nexus of colonialism. The raw material jute was produced in Bengal and it was manufactured in Dundee. But in Bengal, by the beginning of the 20th century, we were beginning to get manufactured jute. And in the course of the 20th century, as a result of the lower labor and other inputs of Bengal, Dundee was wiped out as a jute manufacturing city. So I have no idea what he's talking about, by the way. I understand the point he's trying to make, though, so I guess that's the important thing. In other words, what I'm suggesting to you is that there are these great shifts in global economic power. We've seen it in the case of the Far East. The, the Far Eastern shipbuilding industries absolutely knocked out those um, of Britain. To take a, a, a small example, cultivated pearls in China and Japan destroyed the pearl fisheries of Sri Lanka and of the Gulf. There are great shifts in economic power, as, as I've, I've said. I would agree with those who've said that there is a significant difference between individual cases like the Mau Mau um, uh, prisoners, like the Chagos Islanders, for example, to whom I think a great wrong has been done. These are individual cases. But to take something as, a not, as, 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 as problematic as these economic difficulties strikes me as being um, much more of a problem. And I'm surprised in a way, I know we're talking about Britain, but I'm surprised in a way that nobody has mentioned Italian reparations to Libya. I have mentioned it. Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, Italian reparations to Libya were organized in 2008 by Silvio Berlusconi, whose very name causes a smile of contempt to come over all our faces, and Wama and Gaddafi. They were entirely self-interested. On the one hand, what did Italy want? It wanted contracts for major um, schemes within Libya. And Libya wanted, of course, to sell its oil and gas. But worse, Italy was determined to try to stop what it regarded as the illegal flow of migrants out of Libya, thereby, you could argue, denying their human rights. In other words, this whole business of reparations, when we have seen it happen, has been highly problematic. The Italian concept of reparations to Libya has gone by the wayside. And we've seen the problem of migrants, of course, getting larger and larger. Uh, uh, Western intervention in Libya meant the end of, of Gaddafi. And I think that's one of my problems with reparations. Reparations are always going to be phased. And when reparations are phased, the circumstances are going to change. They're going to be self-interested, and the circumstances are going to change rapidly over time. And as in the Italian-Libyan case, it ends up as a dead letter in any, in any case. Okay. I have to say, all of these interruptions of these random people in the audience interrupting him is really annoying. <laughs> I'm really surprised that they allow that, actually. Like, I feel like the speakers should just have the floor and let them say what they're going to say. You know, well, the people that are involved in the actual debate should be the ones to be debating these points, not people in the audience, you know. I don't know. I guess the Oxford Union has their own rules about how they do it, but I don't know. I just find it kind of weird. I entirely agree with what you've just said. I entirely agree. What I'm pointing out is that whatever you do have a question of reparations, you end up with this quick 
moving situation. Of course, Western intervention was um, uh, highly dubious, but look what happened to the whole reparations thing. They became a dead letter. I shall, um, I shall finish. Actually, I, is, I probably agree. This is really unproductive. Like, I, I, I hate that these people are interrupting him. Like, it's just, it's just rude, you know? I shall, um, I shall finish. I, I probably agree with you. Yeah, I entirely agree. I entirely agree. But just let me wind up briefly by saying I do think there's a great deal more agreement between the two sides. And really the point at issue that I would stress when you come to vote is that you must consider whether reparations are a practical policy. I started with a reference to Scotland. I very nearly came in a kilt, uh, but it wouldn't reach me anyway, so I couldn't get it on. Um, uh, and just to prove that there are different tribes within this country. Um, and I'm going to end with Scotland. Uh, Scotland started to become a colony of England in the 13th century. Uh, Scotland, like Ireland, has indulged in various acts of resistance to English colonialism. But then Scotland, as Dr. Thoreau, I think it was said perfectly reasonably and correctly, began to benefit from the imperial connection, but then began to suffer. It began to suffer because its economy was slanted far too much in the direction of um, major heavy industries. Well, Scotland is making a comeback, and we have done it by a subtle means of reparations. And what we call it is the Barnet formula, <laughs> in which we get taxes out of England which constitute our reparations. And I would say that it would be much more practical. We've talked about aid, we've talked about technical assistance, we've talked about lots of things. I think it should be done subtly. I think it should be done by a series of international Barnet formulas. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so there was at least one of the rebuttals to that. I don't know if I got as much out of that as I would have liked. Um, I had no idea what he was talking about with the bonnet formulas. Bonnet as in like bonnet you put on your head or what you guys call in the UK the bonnet of your car. Or is he using a different word that I couldn't quite figure out. As I said in the beginning, I do believe that the whole idea of reparations is impractical. Like he said, it's really hard to put a monetary number on human suffering or economic oppression or whatever it is. I just think it's a really dangerous road to go down and considering the course of human history, it just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. However, the moral obligations of more powerful countries is another debate, it's a whole other thing to think about. I know being an American, you know, the United States is constantly in the spotlight and being blamed for a lot of things happening across the world. In other countries like the UK, Russia, China, you know, if you have a lot of power, then there is a lot of moral obligation there for you to use that power for good instead of bad. And I guess it just depends on your point of view of whether or not it's used good or bad. I don't know, it's just like a whole mess, isn't it? It's just a big mess. But again, putting the reparation stuff aside, it is interesting just for me to hear the different sides of the British and the Indians in this matter. Like I said, I'm just trying to learn more about what happened historically, and so I am picking up little nuggets from these debates to kind of fill in some of those knowledge gaps. It was super annoying, though, at how much the audience interrupted this guy. I think Dr. Thor had, like, one interruption, very very brief interruption and people were just yelling left and right at this guy. I did not like that. I didn't appreciate that and to me it's really disrespectful and rude. I would just let the guy say what he has to say. Again, that's probably the rules of the Oxford Union and how they allow debates to happen. But towards the end there, it sounded like the people that did not agree with this guy just started like shouting at him to shut him down, which, you know, I just I just don't think that's a very fair way to go about it. So anyway, we are going to get off the subject of reparations because I feel like it's really, really not a very practical thing to be exploring on my channel. Typically, I like to stay away from super controversial subjects because I just like to look at things from more of an educational objective viewpoint. And because I have viewers from different backgrounds on this channel, I really, really hate like pitting them against each other. I did this video though because I've had a lot of requests for it and I am trying to get through your requests on this channel. There are a ton that I still have to get through. So anyway, I hope that 
that you guys will come along on that little journey with me. And if you are so inclined, I do have some social media that you can check me out on and follow me there if you would like. And also if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like and subscribe. I do videos kind of learning about the whole world and we do some space stuff too as well because I'm really into that. So I got a lot more stuff coming your way. Make sure you stay tuned for that. And Roger here and I, we'll see you next time. Thank you.